Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Professor Simon Gibson, OBE, a founding trustee of the Alacrity Programme. Um, he's working with young entrepreneurs just down the road from here, helping them to take their big idea from dream to reality. So uh, let's hear his take on creating opportunities for young people. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Gibson. Good afternoon. I'd like to start out, if I can, by really commending the aims of this conference. Uh, it's the second year it's been held, and I think it is um, acting as a catalyst of change in Wales. What I'd like to do is really focus some comments today, firstly about education, second about the economy, third about innovation, and finally some wrap-up comments about our nation here in Wales. So let's, let's start out by... I was hoping there'd be more young people in here. They've obviously gone upstairs to their sessions. But, you know, when I was their age, I, I constantly asked the question, why bother with education? What was re really the purposes of education? And in subsequent years, I think I've come to the, the realisation that um, education really is about these four things. Maximising human potential, honing skills, capabilities, attributes that will help us uh, in our economy remain prosperous and competitive, Thirdly, facilitate a vibrant democracy with an informed electorate. And thirdly, nurture an understanding that people can see things differently and that those differences merit respect rather than persecution. And today, I really want to focus on number two, if I can. So let's look at the world economy for just one moment. And this is really sobering stuff. So it's a tectonic shift currently going on in global economies. When I saw this graph for the first time, it did make me gasp. So I'm going to share it with you. Here it is. In the 1950s, 70% of the global GDP was uh, basically sourced from the G7. We're at a point now where it's about parity, but by the middle of this century, this, the century where most of these young people in the room today will probably become senior managers in companies, we will have a reversal of fortune. Nearly 70% of the global, global economy will be from outside of the G7. So what does that look like on a country-wide basis? Well, let's have a look. Here we have, um, by country, this is in 2007. One thing I would ask you to note is where is India on this chart? Predominantly, the world is dominated by the, you know, this economy in the USA uh, and a, a familiar list of, uh, of players there. Let's now fast forward to 2050 and look at this. China way out in the lead, India in third place, Brazil in fourth place, Russia in fifth place, Indonesia in sixth place. Now you might say, what's Indonesia got that would put it there? Well, it's almost got the same population as the United States of America today. You've got countries like Mexico racing up the, the, the chart. I put this chart up particularly for senior academics here because I think rather than play the usual routine which is run off and let's have a collaboration with Harvard or MIT or Stanford, some universities I think would be quite wise now to look at these emerging economies and establish relationships with those countries and the universities in those countries. First in, you're likely to be better treated uh, as the economy develops. Now let's look at this uh, economic hierarchy. We've got, um, you know, on the left-hand side, underdeveloped regions. They're typical economic practices that they copy things that other people do. Their advantage is always cost, and the outcome is survival. And does this sound familiar to our economy? <laughs> because in the 1970s, 80s, we were kind of into this game. As you move to the right, which is where you want to be, you know, obviously you end up in a, a better situation with manufacturing, with production efficiencies, you create value, which is a, a combination of quality and cost, and the outcome is wealth. Obviously where we, we are now is in highly developed regions, they're looking to create value, You've got innovation models with insight and opportunity, and there's a sustainable development. Where we all want to be is obviously, and I, I think we're about here in Wales, and we need to be here, is get our economy 
as far right as we can. We have a knowledge economy where we have global leaders. We operate foresight models of innovation as opposed to hindsight models of innovation. And hindsight models of innovation are where analysts get together, they look at the past and they try and establish what the future needs. A foresight model is one where you kind of throw away the past to some extent and concentrate on what might be. Nice to see Stuart doing that in a council. <laughs> Um, and obviously the outcome is a quality of life. And a good quality of life, I think, is, is determined in an economy by the ability of the, of the current generation to pass its wealth to the, and, and its prosperity to the next generation. Currently in the UK, if these young people were in the room who were sitting along here from the schools, they're actually in a situation where perhaps their standard of living might actually be lower than our generation, which is a sad development. I think this is best illustrated by the Tour de France. If you train hard, you've got some good equipment, and you're absolutely dedicated, I think you could probably get on the Tour if you're a good athlete. However, if you want to be in one of those packs that's consistently at the front of the Tour de France, the Sky Team and whatever, you've got to have exceptional equipment, exceptional professional coaching and team, and team management, great athletes, and a really good plan. However, if you want to wear the yellow jersey, it's almost impossible. The, 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 the requirements upon an athlete to consistently, day after day, wear the yellow jersey are mind-boggling. But trust me, those economies that we saw on that chart, who are racing up from right to left, have an ambition to wear the yellow jersey. And we would be remiss if we allow our economy to slip by without having a good a good plan to stay in the leading pack. For, for the Welsh economy to continue to grow, we've got to have all of these gears working. We've got to have a first-class educational system. We've got to learn how to innovate better. We've got to create good technology. And, and, and most importantly, we've got to learn how to commercialise the intellectual property that we do develop. I put this up because these words are, are all used all the time. People are always going on about technology and innovation, but they never actually explain what they are. Well, a good definition of technology is applying knowledge to art and craft. And I think generally people forget the art part of it. They think of craft because of engineering. But let's face it, the creative economy, the creative industries economy in the UK is worth 5.2% of our GDP. It accounts for 71.4 billion a year to our economy, and it employs 1.68 million people. It's one of the things Britain and Wales does particularly well, is the creative arts. And as we better learn to merge those with our engineers, so much the better. And by the way, this at the end, at the bottom here, is MIT's definition of innovation, which I think is great. Useful embodiments to ideas in the marketplace. Let's just have a look at innovation. This is the classic innovation model, linear innovation. You develop a technology, you think of ways you can use or implement that technology, and finally, you take it to market. That's the classic way it's done, and it's the way it's been done in universities for years and years and years. It's often described as invention, innovation, and diffusion. However, the world is moving to a new model, which is best described as interactive innovation. This is technology, implementation, and market, where they're all done at the same time. Where Iterations require simultaneous depth and breadth, and you're constantly reforming your product as it's being developed on all three fronts. You're thinking about diffusion, you're thinking about implementation, and you're, you're, you're constantly working on the technology. Why? Because the technology moves every, every day, it's changing. Let's look at a quick case study. I would say one of the best case studies I can think of is Apple and the iPod. Now, it's a, it seems a long time ago now, but it was only 2001. And you remember when Steve Jobs got up and he launched the iPod? He did three things effectively at the same time. First thing he did was, of course, he developed a platform, the hardware and the software that made up the first iPod. 
They brought some of that technology in, as you'll recall, but nonetheless, they created a new platform. The second thing that they did, which I think often is completely missed in that story, is the innovation associated with microprocessing and micropayments. They got together with the banks and the credit card companies and they persuaded them, first time ever, to allow a credit card transaction to be entered once and then used forever after on a click. How many people would have bought 99 cent tracks of music if every time they needed to do it, they had to put in their credit card, their address, you know, and all the other details, their PIN numbers, it would have just killed it. Jobs persuaded the clearing houses and the, and the credit card companies to allow it to happen just once. And obviously, since then, it's been copied by Amazon and others. What I find that fascinating is now Apple has 600 million accounts on iTunes. And I think they're one of the largest uh, store, you know, they have one of the largest databases of credit cards in the world. Third thing they did was they established a store, which of course, again, in itself was revolutionary. But when you think about it, what they did is three things. They created a new platform, the invention. They changed the way the microprocess, micropayments industry operated, which was the innovation. And thirdly, they handled diffusion by launching this revolutionary store. 600 million users later, they have completely redefined the music market and brought revenue back into a business that was on its knees. But there are, there are things out there that are killing innovation and no more so than in the public sector. But you see it in the private sector as well, and those three things, risk management, governance, and compliance. All of these things, they're there for the right reason, but in many cases, they're used as a cudgel to, to kill innovation itself, which is risky. And it gets more complicated than that. I don't have time to go through it, but if you look at this chart that I've prepared, you can see there's an awful lot of pressures in a corporate environment who are, whose mission is just to kill innovation. We had a, a first Tuesday event in Ottawa last week. We're going to launch one tomorrow night here. Uh, we're going to launch the program here. The subject last week was Nortel, what went wrong? Well, I can tell you one of the biggest things that went wrong at Nortel is they thought they could do it all and they suffer from a distinct case of not invented here syndrome. But here's the question. Why is it that some organizations do it and others can't? And I think the answer to that is quite simply the people in it, the management style, and the manager's ability to create environments and hierarchical structures that support innovation rather than kill it. The other thing I would point out is for a long time in Wales, you could always get money for property, but you could never get money for intellectual property. But I pose the question to you, where is wealth created? We had a program in Wales called Techniums that became Emptiums. And they became Emptiums because we took our eye off of the intellectual property that needed to follow the buildings that were being created. So quickly, I just want to give you an introduction, those who aren't familiar with the Alacti Foundation. It's a postgraduate program that concentrates on taking young people out of university and preparing them to create their own company. And it's a process that takes a minimum of a year and sometimes stretches out to 18 months. And we do three things. The first thing we do is we educate. We give everyone on the program, you just saw Robert on the screen, uh, postgraduate education in commercialization and entrepreneurship. It, in, it in, includes the generous participation of more than 50 professional mentors who come in and help the young people. Second thing we do is we call it opportunity alignment. And this is radically different from most incubators that you'll ever see. We do not ask anyone to come to the foundation with an idea. Us old guys go into large corporates and we say to them, what's killing you and what do you need? And they tell us. And our teams then scrub those ideas down and we develop solutions, believe it or not, that people want to buy. And I've learned many years ago, you're better off starting businesses where you know someone wants to buy something as opposed to creating a business where you hope someone might buy something and you become a little intoxicated with an idea that's a little wonky. And then thirdly, 
with fund success. So each output company, each graduating team in Alacrity, and you need three things to graduate, a verified product, a customer, and a revenue stream. And if you've got those three things in place, you go from being a student team to a company, so graduation is incorporation, and you're recipients of £250,000 of equity funding. And that fund's set up and guaranteed for the young people. And I have to say, so far, the results have been excellent. I think there are big opportunities existing for those who can close that gap between ideas that are in universities and in young graduates, particularly if, like in Alacrity, you can help guide them into the right space with what's going on in the marketplace. And of course, that's, that's what it's all about at Alacrity, merging talent with market needs. And then, just a point to note, because I think it really is important, if you're going to start a business, you're, you're better off rather than second-guessing supply, you, you would benefit from dovetailing demand. So, in closing, we all have a passion for the Welsh economy to do well, for us to produce great companies. I'm encouraged with what's going on in the last couple of years. I think we're making great strides. We just need to do it in a way that's faster, smarter and bolder. Thank you very much.